introducing this year's design keynote speaker, John Epler. John Epler has been playing video games since he could first hold a controller. With a degree in English and Film Studies, he entered the gaming industry in 2007, working as a term tester on Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood. Since then, he's worked on both the Dragon Age and Mass Effect series, Mass Effect franchises as a cinematic designer, before settling into his current role as a narrative presentation lead on the Dragon Age franchise. A little over a year ago, one of my best friends convinced me to pick up Dragon Age Inquisition, never having played any of the other Dragon Age games, and not particularly in Dragons, sorry. <laughs> I admit I was skeptical and I didn't really know what to expect. It was one of the first games to make me blush so hard I needed to recollect myself multiple times. <laughs> Josie and Colin, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> I learned very quickly that I was definitely not alone, and the Dragon Age franchise was a favorite among the player games community. John is here to talk about the lessons the Dragon Age team learned about the unconscious biases they all share, how they push back against those biases, and how they have learned from mistakes they've made. He will speak to the importance of inclusion and diversity in the workplace, and how at the end of the day, even the most introspective and well-meaning people can still make mistakes. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Epler. Thank you, Professor, so I don't actually end up blocking the projector. Um, thanks, everyone. As Jasmine mentioned, I'm John Epler. I'm the narrative presentation lead for the Dragon Age franchise. And the present keynote I'm giving is called the Privilege of Default, Unconscious Bias in AAA Gaming, which is right up there, but I figured I'd repeat it. Because I've already made another presentation that can't be used. Uh, so let's get started. I uh, just want to say thank you, Jasmine, for that introduction. Um, I'm very glad you started playing the Dragon Age franchise. I suggest at some point you should also romance Iron Bowl. If, uh, <laughs> if you like blushing, i just putting it out there. It's not that I'm biased, but I did work on that romance, and it's my favorite romance in the game. Um, thank you to Bonnie for inviting me to do the design keynote at this year's PG Fun. I was very privileged to get you I'm very happy to be here. I'm, the work that this con does is amazing and important. And it's just, it's great to see this type of thing happening. And thank you to the con for the staff, everyone who's helped me out, everyone who's uh, given directions, who takes care of everything around the convention. You all do fantastic work. So thank you so much for everything you do, all the volunteer work you've done. Um, so first of all, who am I? Well, we've already established that, but I'm going to go through some of this again, just because again, I've done this presentation, rehearsed it, and this is part of it. So. <laughs> I'm John Epler Bioware. This is my, my Twitter picture. Um, this was my Twitter picture. <laughs> Not actually the WWE champion, but at PAX this year, we had one uh, one fan who came around and was wearing a belt, and I asked him where he got that belt and commented it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And then he said, well, you should take a picture with the belt and with your sunglasses on. So of course, I did just that. and. I've had a lot of people actually on Twitter when I get into Twitter arguments with people that have said, you're not actually in the WWE. I'm like, yes, I'm aware of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which goes to show how some people approach Twitter. Um, as mentioned, I'm the narrative presentation leader of the Dragon Age franchise. So, so yeah, I guess I've been at Bioware for 10 years. I started in 2007. I actually had applied previous to that for a couple of writing jobs in Austin. Not actually having any experience, I was turned down, and also my writing probably at that point was not sufficiently good. But um, when I graduated, I applied for a term tester position, and just when I was resigning myself to never getting to work in video games, I got a call back, and I got to be a term tester in Sonic Chronicles, which I'm proud of that project. I thought it was, you know, it's not a project everyone thinks about when they think of Bioware and all the games we've done and all our great franchises, but I like Sonic, and I like the game. It was... Uh, it was unfortunate that we were never able to finish the story because it did end on somewhat of a cliff cliffhanger. But um, yeah, it was it was something I was proud of. Uh, it was a small team, so it was as my first experience in the industry was a really good one because I got to know people, I got to do a lot of different stuff, and I didn't have to do well what I had to do later on in my QA career, which was run uh, the same test plan 73 times, which is important, but it's not fun necessarily. <laughs> Um, I also drew a tree. I'm very proud of this tree. <laughs> so there is a story behind this tree. Uh, the way that we built Sonic is we had to build these walk meshes in, which were basically pixel drawings where white meant you couldn't walk on it, black meant you could walk on it. And then they, we had to delete a tree there, and our, our level artist had already moved on to something else. So they said, well, why don't you draw the tree? And so I drew a tree. 
I am, just in case you, you know, you missed it, I'm, I'm very proud of that tree. <laughs> it's a good tree, thank you. In all honesty, it was just, it's, it's funny, I, I mean, I laugh at it because it was kind of ridiculous, but at the time, it was the first thing I'd ever done that actually made its way into a ship video game, so. For me, that was such a cool feeling. It's like, yeah, you know what, I didn't do a lot else, but if you look at this tree, I drew this tree, and it's, it's a good tree, so. Um... I then moved into Narrative QA from Mass Effect 2. So Narrative QA is essentially, it's quality assurance, but it's quality assurance that focuses on the story, on the cinematics, on everything around that. So it's, you know, go with, work with the writers, find the stuff that doesn't work, give them feedback, work with the cinematics team, find cinematics that aren't firing, give qualitative feedback on story flow. By the end of the project, it's mostly go through scenes and make sure that everything's working in that cinematic. But it was a great introduction to being part of the narrative narrative, being part of the story, which for me has always been what I wanted to do in video games. I actually, you know, I say I graduated with a Bachelor of Film Studies in English, but in reality, I started out in computing science until I realized I actually wasn't good at computing science. I almost failed out my first year, and then I moved to English and realized, no, actually, I want to make video games. What I want to do is story. So this was kind of my first shot at that. And then a little bit more on The Old Republic. So they had the six or the eight class stories, and we were each there were four of us in the team. We were each given two, and basically we played through the game and each of the class stories, read through all the conversations, and gave feedback to the writers. It, it was three or four months. Most of the game wasn't playable at that time, so it was essentially reading through dialogue files for three months. Which, I mean, it's not. It's again, it's at the time I, I thought it was really dry, but in reality, I was reading through dialogue files sitting in front of a computer. It's not exactly the most torturous existence. So. <laughs> Um, and then I joined the cinematics team. So I started on the DLC Witch Hunt for Dragon Age Origins. I know that I worked on the first scene where you have the dog in the DLC, so once you actually get to the tower, and I know I worked on another scene, but it's been long enough ago that I could not tell you which one it was. All I remember is it involved the books, so if anyone can actually help me figure out what scene that is, I'd be very grateful. Um, I then moved on to Dragon Age 2, and I started on Dragon Age 2 from the beginning, um, worked on all the DLC, so I worked on Legacy, which introduced uh, that charming fellow over there for the first time. I worked on the Exiled Prince, which I was the only cinematics person on it, so I got a lot of experience, you know, figuring out what, how do you define, how do you basically define narrative flow? Um, I got to do some fun scenes in that one, and then I also worked on Mark the Assassin, which was the one where we brought to leave today, and the end result of which was. I got to go to New York Comic Con, and I got to sit on a panel, and I was thinking, oh, this is great, it's finally opportunity, everyone's going to want to know what I did, except it was a panel with me, Felicia Day, Mike Laidlaw, the creative director, and Dave Gator, the lead writer, and also another producer. And so the number of questions I got were zero, because I was basically there to fill a spot. Nobody cares about, and fairly enough, I wouldn't care about what I had to say at that point either. But everyone wanted to know what Felicia, talk to Felicia Day, talk to Mike, talk to Dave. And the producer got one question, which was again one more than I got. So, uh, which is fine. Again, it wasn't. A, I wasn't. It was. I totally understand why nobody wanted to talk to me on that panel. And then I moved on to Dragon Age Inquisition. So I was actually there on 2012. I was one of the first people to move on that project. We all moved on after. I was originally on the production of the expansion for Dragon Age 2, the Exalted March. When that got canceled, we all got moved on to Inquisition. So we ended up. Uh, being the first people on the project, the first people to take a look at Frostbite and start defining how all that worked, how we made an RPG out of an engine that had thus far just made Battlefield games. I also did some Joker scenes in Mass Effect 2. It was minimal stuff, but I got to do a few funny moments, but that was being in the right place at the right time and having a person there who was willing to give me that opportunity, even though I had no idea what I was doing. So, um, And then as of the DLC, I became the narrative presentation lead. So I worked on Jaws Take On, I worked with the level art team, level design team, to find story flow, worked with the writing team to define what conversations happened when, what was the story we wanted to tell, and how did we want to tell it. Um, you know, laser, the big laser beam that melted the ice wall, the uh, various Avar barbarians running up the tree. I was, I, so my favorite story from Jaws Hakon was one of our writers, Sylvia, wanted to add a conversation at the end where you recruited the Barrett the agent. And the condition I gave it to, I was like, you can have that scene. But there's one condition, and that's every single line has to have at least one bear pun in it. And <laughs> impressive. And actually, and she managed to do that. You had some. I think there was something like 15 bear puns in that conversation. And it's like, I, you know, I was I was very happy I made that condition. Yeah, that was uh, that was good work by Sylvia. 
Um, and then the one, the piece of content I'm the most proud of actually in my career thus far, which was the second piece of DLC content for Dragon Age Inquisition, which was a Trespasser DLC. So I'm afraid I'm going to spoil Trespasser for people who haven't played it. I apologize in advance. I'm not going to get too deep into spoilers, but it's essentially, we it was our way of wrapping up a lot of the story of Inquisition, of giving the Inquisitor what we consider to be a satisfying end to their story, and also starting to set up what happens in the future, you know, what's stolen plan, you know, and bringing back uh, the Canari, who had been a threat before, but never really showed up in Inquisition, except for a couple of times in Iron Bull's plot, so, and this involved a lot of work, again, closely working with level artists, with level designers, with concept artists, with storyboard artists, with writing, and it was the most, I would say, probably the most cohesive piece of content I've ever well, what's, the word? what's the narrative presentation? Because I've said cinematic, suddenly I'm talking about narrative presentation. I mean, it's a lot of this. Uh, I've often described my job as having, as basically taking puppets and uh, mashing them against each other. But, and I actually have talked to Dave, and Dave has said that this is in fact Dorian's OTT. So <laughs> he will, he will go with Iron Bull. He will go with you. But in the end, the only person who can satisfy Dorian is Dorian. <laughs> um, and it's also yeah, just in game a lot of a lot of romance scenes because romance and you know being able to connect with your characters is such a big part of what Bioware does with their game. So other studios focus on action scenes. We tend to focus more on the character moments than on the character romances. Um, but honestly, it's mostly some of this, and some of this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. It's 40 plus hours of conversation because it turns out you talk to a lot of people in Bioware games. And <laughs> It's not always about something, and it's not always necessarily about something huge and life impacting and interesting. And sometimes we just need you to talk to someone for a while. And so it's a lot of making sure that that's interesting, that the people who play our games can can go into that conversation and not feel like they, well, like they, they hate themselves. Right? So, and uh, it's the bulk of what I do and the bulk of what my team does is figuring out ways to make those conversations interesting. So the comment, I've, the, the comparison I've often used is Soap Opera has five episodes a week. Um, and they have to make every one of those. It's mostly it's a lot of a conversation, and they they use a lot of, of writing tricks. They use a lot of you know big twists and big. But at its core, it's about making people talking to each other for 25 to 30 minutes every day, five times a week, look interesting. And that's something kind of what we're trying to do is make that interesting. Make it interesting when you talk to someone. We don't have we have some challenges that they don't have. They can just have someone act. We actually have to animate everything, which is a lot more expensive. But at its core, it's the same principle. So it's basically, as mentioned, oh, actually, I completely forgot I have a computer here. Let's look at that. Um, square boards and beat boards. It's scene requests if somebody wants to see, for example, a bear that you can recruit as an agent. Um, it goes through me. Uh, building scenes, so, you know, a castle explodes and a mountain collapses, things like that. Conversations, as mentioned, every time you talk to somebody, we have to handle it. Ambience, which are, you know, there's people in the world doing things, um, you know, person, Chopping at a tree, person using a pickaxe on a rock, person stirring a pot. That's all stuff we have to handle. And then in world narrative. So like I said, the ice or the ice wall that got destroyed by the laser and John take on, the our barbarians climbing the, the wall afterwards, that's all stuff that we have to work with the level designers to handle. But it's ways to tell the story in game. I mean, a lot of studios do a lot more of this than we do, and it's something we're trying to push towards a little bit more because the less we take you out of the game, the more interesting that is. Um Basically, anytime the game and the story meet, that's where a narrative presentation exists. So I'm neck deep in neck deep in narrative. All I actually was going to change the slide to I'm, I'm elbows deep in narrative because I thought that was a funny image to that, but I clearly forgot to change the slide. So imagine I said elbow deep in narrative. But something you've noticed, and this is something I will be very honest about, is I am the, a very privileged person. I check pretty much almost all these boxes. Let's see if I can remember how to. Keep clicking with us, and then, yeah, there we go. I might not hit all the boxes, but I hit enough of them. And I mean, that's the honest truth is that's a lot of the state of the games industry right now is people who are making decisions are checking a lot of these boxes. So I make a controversial statement here. AAA games have a diversity problem. <laughs> I know, crazy. I know it's crazy, but I think this is probably something that we can all agree on. It is starting to get better, but as, as with a lot of things, anytime we do it two step forward, one step back, every time there's more diverse characters, there's a lot of a backlash, as I'm sure everyone here has seen. Anyone who's on Twitter, anytime something comes up that's even remotely controversial or remotely progressive, there's always about 80 people 
usually the same 80 people willing to jump in and attack. <laughs> I don't see a lot of them anymore because I've blocked most of them. But um, and that's the thing is when you say, spend your life seeing yourself media, and I include us there because Hog had a character creator, but character creators are not a get out of jail free card because who you market with, who you choose to put out there as the face of your game makes a difference. But when you see yourself in media all the time, you start to think of yourself as the default. That's a problem. That is a problem that a lot of people in gaming or involved in gaming at peripheries or even in the center of gaming have, especially any, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of characters that are protagonists that are that character. And, oh, and I did this slide entirely out of, but it basically, and then you start getting people who say, oh, it's pandering. Oh, that character, that game has female protagonists. You're just pandering. Oh, that game has a queer protagonist. You're just pandering. And that's, again, something you see on Twitter. Anytime this comes up, it's never, it never strikes people that maybe it's not pandering. Maybe it's just not having the same default protagonist for every game. And so that's, that's the, that's the culture we created, unfortunately. Now, by we, <laughs> I mean AAA games. Is that, that is the audience we cultivated by making a specific person the default all the time. As soon as that person is not the default, they end up telling you, oh, you're just pandering. You're pandering to this group or to that group. And it's getting past that mindset. It's like, no, that's not pandering. That's just actually having diversity that reflects the world we live in because we're not the majority. White you know, cisgender, white, heterosexual men are not the majority anymore, and it's time that the games industry start to reflect that. I mean, or they do this. They take examples of diversity. They say, oh, well, you've got this protagonist, or this protagonist, or this character, you know, and the fact that I had to reach as far back as Ultima 7 says, <laughs> I love Ultima 7. Don't get me wrong. It is actually one of my favorite games of all time. It's the first game where I realized I could do whatever I wanted, including apparently stacking up crates and getting on top of a rooftop and dying, but <laughs> um, but then they take those examples of diversity and say, oh, well, you know what? You got your diverse characters. What are you complaining about? There's plenty of those protagonists in gaming. And I mean, the fact that you can count those characters, you can't count all the characters that fulfill the default, says pretty much everything you need to say. And they hold them up as good enough. No, no, you've got your characters. That's good enough. And again, these are all games. I use these games. I actually picked these games up specifically. These are all games I enjoy playing. But every single one of them, even when we were going as far back as Wolfenstein, and all you had was with Angry Face, BJ Blaskowitz down there. Uh, Commander Keen, although I actually don't really know if that accounts, but um, Kyle Katarn, when we had FMB Gaming. Um, all these characters, though, they're all they're all men, they're all white, and if, and if their sexuality or gender identity is ever referenced, it's always heterosexual and cisgender. It's never anything else. And those were the games that I grew up on. It's not a new problem. So this leads to a toxic culture of entitlement. I actually went and I started looking for examples of, of this, and I decided, you know what, this is a terrible idea. So instead, Aww. I found some pictures of kittens. Because honestly, we could all use a little time every day to look at pictures of adorable kittens. I actually tried to take pictures of my own cats for this, but of the three of them, two of them are assholes. So <laughs> instead, this is what you get. Um, but yeah, it's it's if you it's it's not hard to find any example of harassment. It happens, I mean, it's it's happened every day. Major events happen all the time, and it's just, it's becoming, it's not, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's necessarily becoming better, it's just, it's always there. And, again, why show examples of that when I can show you examples of kids? And that's the thing, we need to fix it. It's on AAA. This is the audience, again, that we've cultivated for 25, 30 years, because before they started making the market, Atari, I think it was Atari, or Nintendo that started deciding to market specifically to this demographic, there wasn't this same idea that games were all for the same type of person. But they decided, well, you know what, let's start marketing Nintendo, let's start marketing all these systems to a very specific demographic, which was almost always young men. And since then, it's just been, let's just keep doing what we've been doing. So, more than anyone else, though, it's not just developers. Specifically, it's those of us with privilege that need to fix it. It's not, we shouldn't be putting the weight of fixing this problem on, you know, and marginalized and uh, diverse identities, we should be putting it on us because we are the ones who benefited from it for the longest time. We are the ones who need to start fixing it. We need to be critical of what we consume. We need to be critical of what we create. You know, reading different publications, reading, getting different viewpoints from all over the place is hugely important. And something that it's not just reading the same websites all the time. It's not just reading the same news articles from the same people all the time. It's finding viewpoints that aren't ours and starting to read and seeing what they're saying and actually taking it to heart, not just reading and say, oh, yeah, you know what, that's true, but 
I'm sure we're not. My assumption is always assume that they're talking about something you worked on and then learn how you can fix it. Stop doing that thing. Now, this is about mistakes we made on, on Dragon Age Inquisition. Because the big thing, the, the honest truth of all this is the best answer is always going to be diversity in hiring. You should always hire more diverse people. You should always look for people who do not fit the majority viewpoint. Or I say, sorry, I should say we should. And diversity in hiring gives you diversity in perspectives. It means you're not just trying to find the perspective of someone who's not like you. You're also taking people who aren't like you and asking them for their perspective. And they're building the content because they build content in a truer way than you ever than we ever can. Pay consultants, if you don't have necessarily have the ability to hire the perspectives you need all the time, you should be paying people for their perspective. So there's consultants out there who can consult on pretty much any issue that you need, you just have to be sure you're paying them and bringing them in at the right times, not just bringing them in as cover for your future mistakes. So one of the, th the things we've adopted is if we take, we bring in a consultant is any mistakes are on us, any successes are on them. It's not, it's making sure that's understood. We need to own our mistakes. We need to own our mess. We need to be better because if we're not better, then, well, I mentioned before what happens. So how can we be better? We've learned some lessons. I mean, between Dragon Age Origins, Dragon Age 2, Dragon Age Inquisition, all the DLC, we've made a lot of content. I don't know how many hours of it we've made, but there's been a lot of it. And in that content, there's been a lot of things we've done wrong. So let's talk about default. I like this picture, specifically because of where Solus is. Um, but it's also worth noticing. There's two things you can tell about the Inquisitor. This is supposed to be default Inquisitor. It can be anyone except clearly a white, a white person, and clearly using the default masculine model. So it's default. Assuming default is the that's the problem here. I also, you know. <laughs> um, so talk about three lessons we've learned while we're making Dragon Age Inquisition. Because, again, the most recent project we've worked on is the one that I, I think we can draw the most lessons from. Lesson one that we learned is everything you do matters. Everything on the project from making documentation to choosing how your seating arrangements are, all that stuff matters for diversity. As simple as documentation, the first thing you write about your game, the design documents you write about what you want your game to be, makes a difference. How do you refer to the player? Something we have, we've we stopped doing, but we had previously done on older projects is referring to the player as he, always he. How does the player, the player does this and he does it. And something we've started adopting is the player is always they. It's always a neutral term. It's never giving the player anything, any kind of identity beyond they're a person playing your game. That's all you need to know about them. They're not, and that's reflected in the documentation you write. Even the wording you use to describe actions can also make a difference. Just how you write your documentation. Like I said, what pronouns do you use to describe the player? What pronouns do you use to describe anything in your game? That makes a difference. When you're showing content, which follower are you using to display that content. This was all about follower customization, and we used Blackwall. Blackwall, who is, I'm, and I know there are a lot of people love Blackwall. Blackwall, I like Blackwall too, but Blackwall is also the most, he is the, he's the, the white cishet male protagonist we have, or follower we have. He doesn't have anything else beyond that, really, and that's the character we used on a lot of our marketing material. He has an interesting story, he has an interesting characterization, but when you actually use that character on a lot of what you're showing internally, people start to think that that's how you see your followers. It's you're always assuming the follower is a cis-head white man. And Blackwell, again, is the best example of that. Or even more boring. And this, trust me, this is boring. No, but when you start identifying the hero gender, you have gender male, gender female. You're immediately saying that in this game, gender is a binary, which means everything you go down, everything you go past that point, you're looking at gender as a binary, and that's immediately influencing how people think, how people talk. When you start to solve, look at solving problems around gender and a gender identity and giving players more options, the base assumption is always that gender is going to be a binary. So how you define how you define these variables can make a huge difference in the game you're making. And this all leads into unconscious biases. Something I noticed, I was looking back at Origins for some of the marketing material, and I've talked about how romance is important in Bioware games, and it is. Romance and characterization is a huge part of what the games we make. And in Origins, we almost exclusively marketed our romances with Morgan and a male protagonist, or Alistair and a female protagonist. 
they weren't the only romance options, but they were the romance options we used in our marketing we used when we talked about the game. And that also has an impact. People see that and they think, well, so clearly the game only has heterosexual romance. And it didn't. And that was a big thing for us. But we didn't talk about it to the extent. The only times we talked about it was when developers would actually go out and start talking about romances. So when Dave Gator would go out and talk about the game, when Mike Laidlaw would talk about the game, when any of the other people working on that project would talk about the game, they would start, they would reference the fact that you had these other options. But this is what we marketed with. We marketed with Morgan and Male Hero or Alistair and Female Hero. And even if stuff doesn't show up in game, I actually really like this picture. Um, it's one that we've used a lot. It's Hero Stabbing the Table, which you only actually ever did really at the end of the game. But, uh, and you have all your followers in the background looking, well, Cassandra's looking, shocked. I I don't actually know who that is behind the Inquisitor's right shoulder that looks like it might be, might be, no, sorry, right shoulder. That's left shoulder. I don't actually know who that person is. The Inquisitor's right shoulder. So if you, on the left, an Inquisitor, if you're looking at it. <laughs> that guy, right under if it. I don't actually know who that is. But he looks like he's uh, mildly conscious. <laughs> but anyways, I like this picture. And it's, uh, but the thing is, is again, it's a white male Inquisitor. That's who we're saying the Inquisitor is. And it defines how the, envir the environment you talk about the game in. And as you're discussing the project internally, it defines how people are willing, to, what people are willing to talk about, what people, what people are willing to bring up as concerns. Um, and if diversity is a priority, then people feel more comfortable having those discussions. People feel more comfortable coming up to you and say, hey, this character you've written or this character, this scene you've done is actually kind of offensive for these reasons, or I don't think you're being sensitive enough about this issue. If people don't feel comfortable, they're less willing to do that. They don't want to be seen as making waves. Because people who are comfortable give you honest criticism, something we've had happen before, and it's something we've, we've tried hard to push back and eliminate is, the phrase, this isn't a problem for me, but it might be a problem for someone else is, which first of all, it always means that it will be a problem for someone else. It may be a problem for someone else. It means somebody will have an issue with it. And it's always a justified issue. It's always something that we should have changed. And it's not a problem for me oftentimes means it actually is a problem for me. I just don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about it at this point. And if you make sure that those people feel comfortable with that, then you start getting more honest feedback, which means you avoid the biggest problem in your, with your project. You avoid making decisions that offend people that what well, you want playing your game. Because we want everyone to enjoy our game. And if you don't <laughs> you know, other people are gonna find out. I can honestly say I've worked on this on this broadcast for almost seven years now. I still cannot tell you why this happened. <laughs> and it's and it amuses me every time. It is it is aside from the bug where you occasionally get a dark spot in, in instead of a romance partner, and you get to see Alistair grinding on a dark spot. <laughs> this is my favorite bug, because it's so ridiculous. And it makes no sense. And everyone's just like, yeah, this happens all the time. <laughs> um, and if, you know, and especially in the age of social media, if you don't find out the problem, if you don't find the problem, somebody else will. And they will make sure to tell you about it and show you. And again, like I said, this just, there's something about this that is magical. <laughs> let's talk about lesson number two. I use Lord Trifles and Yusha here because default is insidious. It shows up where you don't expect it, and it shows up in ways that you don't necessarily see immediately. That's not always true. Here's Default Warden. I think you can all see what I'm talking about with this one, and being literally the embodiment of the brown-haired white male protagonist, also a warrior and also a human noble, which it says a lot. <laughs> and sometimes it's not. So I'm going to give you a second to look at this and for those who don't have the context, this is the first scene of Trespasser. We realized throughout the entirety of Inquisition, we never actually got to let you see your army and let you march in front of your army. So we said, you know what? The first scene of Trespasser is going to be you marching past your entire army. This giant organization you spent all this time putting together. And then we just realized after we shipped it that, oh, shit, every single person here is a white dude. <laughs> every single one and that's from starting from the left all the way to the right every single one of those people are and the reason for that is because when we build these groups we build so these are this is what's i'm going to go a little bit technical here this is what we call like character these are essentially just meshes that you put an animation on they, they can't talk they can't react they don't have any ai they just stand there and they play a looping animation so we built these groups and then we just copy paste it essentially spawn them all the way down but when we built the groups like characters by default don't necessarily don't use a specific head the first head we built which at the time was 
weird and not actually human head, but it turned into that head there. And the body inherits the color, the skin color of the head. So we ended up with a massive group of nothing but white soldiers. And I take responsibility for this because this is something I should have caught as a cinematically, and I didn't. Because, elsewhere in the DLC, we actually did have a much more diverse group. Because, in this case, this wasn't somebody just taking a brief, or taking a group and copy-pasting it. This was somebody spawning every single one of these characters and creating that spawner at the time, assigning animation. Because when we think about it, when we're actually paying attention, we actually make sure we make these changes. But in that previous case, we never did. We don't, it's, it's the issue of it's not a deliberate thing, but it means that if your default is always the same, anytime you don't make a point of deviating from that default, you end up with this we are just sold your army ever in the previous slide. And that's, again, a problem because later on you have this, and even at the beginning of the game, you had a much more diverse group of characters. But this was because, again, there was a point made of actually going through all of our cutscenes on Inquisition and making these changes and going through all the background characters and making sure that they were diverse. So, again, we didn't end up with nothing but white dudes. And, you know, this we have this one. And like I said, that's why it's dangerous. Because someone needs to catch it. You need someone in there to actually catch these problems. And in both of these things, we made sure to catch it. But when we don't, if your default is, again, set to white dude, that's all you're going to get. Both development. And this is something I was that I was, I was happy we did. So on Inquisition, or on Origins, when you chose just play the game, all you want to do is start the game. It always made you a human noble warrior. And always a dude. On Inquisition, if you chose just start the game, it would randomly choose... Your class would randomly choose your gender, or randomly choose your race and your gender. So there was a, basically a 20 or a 17.5% chance of getting any of one of the eight available race gender combinations, which I was happy about. And I was, you know, and now we have a different default. We've set it up so our defaults are different. Um, there's a, now an actual truly random default. We don't just make it always the same white dude. So when you start spawning these characters, it randomly chooses a head and it assigns it a. Uh, a skin color, and also, you know, it's out of those heads and then changes the character's body. And I've also instituted a bias so that, you know what, if there is a more, there's a larger chance of getting someone other than a white dude when you randomly change one character because the best way to do that, make sure that these, you do have that diversity, is program it in and nobody's going to change it after that point because it's not worth it for them. So, yeah, you just make sure you, this wasn't actually when we, this was before we did this, but this was another scene where somebody had to spot every one of those characters and they ended up being a lot more diverse. Unfortunately, we also need to remember that there's still room for improvement. This was our default head one for the human. And again, brown-haired white guy. We have other heads that are not brown-haired white guy, but we made this our head number one. So, you know, something we do in the future and something we've talked about doing in the future is either randomizing it or choosing a more diverse head for the default. Because if you just go through and you just mash your way through character creation, this is who you're going to get. And honestly, he's kind of boring. <laughs> Finally, lesson three, it's never too early for diversity. Start as soon as the project starts. Pre-production is a great time to get this started. What happens in pre-production? It does set the tone for the rest of production. Rest of production. The decisions you make as you write, again, as I said earlier, as you're making the documentation, this ties together the previous two lessons, but what you do at the beginning of the project sets the tone for the rest of the project. You know, before anyone's even written a line, I actually just... This is the dialogue editor for Origins. It's not much different, except in process, it's different color scheme, but the actual underlying fundamentals are the same. We've already made lots of choices. This is the cutscene editor, also from Origins, and this was our first head work for the Inquisitor. This was Inquisitor Alpha, the first guy we made. Um, we combined that with our first rig, I, again. Our first animation rig was not female Inquisitor, our first animation rig was, again, that dude. So what did that mean? Every time you open the comment the cutscene editor, this was the default character that you'd see for all your cutscenes as you're building them. What that means is you start building your content with this in mind. You don't start, you don't think about, okay, well, what if you have, you know, what if your character is uh, an elf? What if your character is a different ethnicity? What if your character is a different gender? This is what you get. This is what you start with. And that makes a huge difference because that's who you build everything with. And again, this guy shows up all over the place. I don't know if any of you saw the demos, but we use this character for every single one of our demos. And yeah, it's really nice if he stopped showing up. 
honestly. And actually, for the longest time, it wasn't even him. There was a character about about six slides ago that had a very strange... Like, he was the actual default head. And he looked kind of like uh, a combination of... What I'm thinking of, of Joshua Jackson and... Uh, I can't remember the other But anyways, he was actually kind of freaky. And he also showed up a lot. And anyways... The worst, best case scenario, you end up with great animations. If anyone noticed that the shoulders on all the female characters are always like this, yep, there you go. That's because they're all using the default animations, which are all done on the male rig, the male animation rig. That's a problem. We need to start, and something we've started doing is we actually have a have started working on a rig that has that is not that just changes based on a whole bunch of parameters, which actually means that we should, the days of shoulders hunched. Inquisitor should actually be coming to an end, which would be really nice because they look really, really funky. Um, I like this. This isn't actually a bad thing, but this scene was done with the human male Inquisitor, and you know, as a result, when it was the human dwarf or male dwarf Inquisitor, now he's standing on a stool, <laughs> and that's how he's able to romance our bullets. I like to think he just carries a stool with him everywhere, <laughs> and no matter where he is, he just unfolds it, gets up. And but it's in, it influences how you build content. I mean, this this is a good, a funny example because, you know, humans and elves and dwarves and Qadari are not groups that are represented in the real world. But actually, you know, different gender identities, different sexualities, different races. If you're building content with just cis head white guy in mind, everybody else is getting essentially the seconds. They're getting the version of the content that you put in there after you got that one working. So, getting the rest of that content as your priority should is a huge thing. So one thing we've done, like I said, our concept artists have actually probably been the best at spearheading this. So when they do concept art for the new for new stuff, um, ever they use they always use a different. It's never ever what you do anymore. They've changed to different you know different sexualities. So we have also different races. We have different everything other than what we did previously, which was this is our default. This is the guy we're building. And kind of like I said, concept artists have been absolutely the best at it. Um, you do need a default. Probably not going to be DJ Slime Time, but um, you know, I I I, I laughed. I, when I saw that one, I laughed because again, it's you know, you seeing the mistake, seeing this this stuff happen to the stuff you worked on is actually this far out. It's it's far enough that any that if this had happened like six weeks after ship, I might have been a little bit more hurt by it. But now it's funny because I can look back and I'm like, yep, that's all it's all very true. Um, but make diversity a priority early. So make your first first romances we start to make are not going to be are not going to be the straight ones. We're going to start on other characters, other generated other romances first, and then start worrying about cis and white male, and they'll be okay. <laughs> well, I mean, probably. <laughs> Knowing to, from what I've heard on Twitter, a lot of them won't be okay. But honestly, we're kind of at a point where if you're on Twitter harassing people, we probably don't want. So anyway, to recap, um, lesson one, everything you do matters. Even the smallest decision, something you thought you just threw in there because it needed to be done, that stuff matters. It sets the groundwork for what comes, and if it's not, you're not focusing on diversity, it's going to be a problem. Again, default is insidious. This is not stuff that happens because someone is sitting there thinking, oh, I can't wait to make all these characters, you know, white males, but it happens because they are that by default, and then they never change them, and that's why it's huge problem because you need to focus on it early and get that default set up early. And like I said, it's never too early for diversity. Pre-production happens at the beginning of the process and that's when you need to start thinking about diversity. Think about your character creator. Think about the characters in your game. Think about how all that supports a message of diversity and a message of inclusion, especially because at Bioware we want to prioritize those things because it's important. I mean, again, our Diverse audience is one of, I think, our greatest strengths is that we don't have to rely specifically on one demographic for building our, our games. We have so many people who love our games and making them feel included, making them feel like part of the community, like we care about them, is a huge part of what, why I do what we do. I mean, I've had, I've gotten message emails from people who played our games, you know, and I, Dave Gitter has even more stories than I do, but we've gotten emails from people who played our games and just had, you know, made, oh, and also, sorry, I hit the button by accident. Diversity and perspectives is critical. It's important to get people on your team early that have that diversity. And if you, and any perspectives you lack, you need to pay consultants. You need to bring people in and pay them to do it. You can't just, you can't just go on on Google and Google diverse perspectives and say, yeah, that's good enough for me. 
but as I was saying, it's that's for me that's a big thing is we get people who play our games and tell us things about you know how it changed their life, how it made them realize who they were, and that to me is such. It is why we do what we do. I mean, why make why make games if you're not making someone's life a little bit better? You're making someone's life a little bit happier. What's what's the point in building games if that's not what you're aiming for? It? My opinion, at least. Anyways, we have to own our mistakes because even, even whatever comes out next, we are going to mess it up in some way. There is going to be there are going to be people in this audience. I guarantee you, our next game will come out and they will have something to say to me about something we missed. And please continue doing that. Because we can be better and we have to be better. As developers, as an industry, we need to be better about how we make games and how we build these games and what these games talk and say about the people we are and the people we want to be and the people we want playing our games. Another kid <laughs> picture because we've seen what happens when we don't do these things. And again, I as again, as a cishet white male, I get very little of harassment, but I still get enough harassment that every morning I go onto Twitter and I go through my notifications and I block a half dozen people who have decided that I am ruining everything in their lives and that and you know their favorite insult being a cuck apparently that's i don't know i honestly it actually has gotten to the point where i find it actually quite funny to be called that because it's just such a lazy insult <laughs> they need some creativity i mean if they were creative they wouldn't be doing that so <laughs> anyways that's that's my presentation that's twitter this is what i do most spend most of my time doing is i tweet memes at various uh you know, Fox News, I tweet memes at Donald Trump. <laughs> Having that meme has been so helpful because I've tweeted it about a dozen different tech conservative bloggers and other people. That one and also at Donald Glover and community coming in and the room on fire. That's also a fantastic. And honestly, I think that's how we all feel about 80% of the time these days. Um, thanks for listening to me talk about our mistakes. Um, <laughs> And like I said, keep letting us know when we mess up, because like I said, we definitely will. It won't be deliberate, it won't be malicious, but that's we're making a lot of content, and we are things. Sometimes we're going to make mistakes, and people need to let us know when we do that, because that's we like we like to hear that. It's not no one's no one's feelings are getting hurt because they're being told, hey, you did something really really ridiculous here, or this didn't work out, or this was offensive. That's the stuff we need to hear. Like I said, that's why we do what we do, because we love all of our fans. We love everyone who plays our games and who loves our games and cares enough about our games to be that passionate. Because we want our... I, I personally, and I think I speak for everyone on the team, we all want our games to make the world a slightly better place, because there's a lot of things that are making the world a less happy place, and we want to be one of the people, who are, one of the groups that are pushing back against that wherever possible. So, so I'm sure there are questions. <laughs> Time for questions. <laughs> um, I have the mic, so just go ahead and raise your hand, and I can pass and bring the mic over to you. Hey, John. Um, so, question for you: How, you know, even though you've worked at Bioware for most of your career, how receptive do you find studios to the idea of someone actually consulting? So I know, like Patrick reached out to friends he knew, but that's not the same as hiring a consultant. Well, we, we hire, we actually have started uh, hiring consultants. It depends on the studio, I think. But we, I think it's important to be that, to be receptive to hiring consultants, especially outside consultants. And sometimes you are going to have a friend you talk to and they're going to give you an idea. But at the end of the day, finding someone to come in and consult on that stuff is probably, is going to be the best way. And like I said, I can't speak for other studios because I've only ever been in Bioware, but I know there are other studios that have consult, have brought people to be a consult. I think Rye brought, uh, Brought people has brought people in, and I know I'm missing one or two other studios, but I think it's starting to gain in uh, gain in popularity in large part because I think a lot of a lot of students are seeing what I was mentioning, which is when you don't have the diversity, you get you get that you get things like uh, hate squads on Twitter, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants their developers to be attacked for things like that. So, and frankly, I think a lot of us are just doing it because. At this point, not only do we want to make good games, uh, those types of games for the benefit of our fans and for the benefit of social progression, it's also large partially because we want to spite the people who wouldn't want us to make those games. Because <laughs> every time I see somebody complain that we've uh, we've given into the SJWs, I know I've done a good thing. So. <laughs> so uh, what's up? What's up with the lack of romanceable um, queer butch 
female characters. Because, like, I, I don't know about you, but I, I do want a little bit of pandering. Yeah. I, I think I deserve it. I think that's entirely, that's an entirely fair question. And I think the honest truth is that I think part of it is because we, and as mentioned, if we don't have people consulting on that, we end up missing that. And we, because we're trying to be progressive, we're saying, well, we don't want to stereotype. We don't want to stereotype, you know, well, if they're Bush, they're clearly queer. But as a result, we think we've gone too far in the other direction where we've gone, we're trying so hard not to stereotype, we're avoiding what some, a lot of people actually want, which is queer Bush characters. So I think going forward, it's not, so, it's, let's put it this way, it's not lost on us that that's something people want. It's not lost on us that that's far we've done a less than spectacular job of that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you talked about in your presentation about making people, helping people be comfortable mm -hmm. to make criticisms and making an environment that's, I guess, conducive to constructive criticism. Um, how do you do that? I mean, it's, you know, it's good that you're here. Um, this is a great place to do that. But, um, you know, at your studio and sort of everyday practices, um, beyond sort of, on? Yes, um, oh, beyond sort of hiring consultants to come in occasionally? Like, how do you create that environment in which criticism is it, it starts at the top. It's honestly a lot of making sure people understand that there's, well, that there's no, retro, never, no retribution for criticism. You say what you want, making sure people understand that having that, and you have to do that both at the top and from the very bottom level. So even things like when you send out an email, not saying, hey, guy, but saying, hey, everyone, or hey, folks. My favorite is folks because apparently I talk like I'm a, like I'm in the deep south sometimes, but I also use y'all a lot. And even though I've never been to Texas, so, but it's just trying to get, trying to avoid, you know, gendered words a lot of the time. And it's also just having that attitude from the people at the top of your studio. So having Aaron Flynn make it, make it clear every time we have a company meeting that criticism is, is a huge part of what we do and that he wants that criticism. And for the rest of us, it's just embodying that attitude too. So if somebody comes to you, not getting defensive, learning never to get defensive because Nobody likes being told they've done something wrong, but that's what we need and that we need to hear that. So it is taking the criticism, you know, stepping back and then making sure that when you respond to the criticism, you're not, even if you don't agree with all of it, because some of it's going to be about stuff that that person's an expert on, some of it's going to be on just general stuff about the character. It's acknowledging the stuff that you're not actually capable of really responding to properly. Because if you're, I mean, Patrick has been really good about work because he's got a lot of, of women writing on his team is, the women will tell him something is, you know, this comes across, this comes across that. And it's him saying, yep, I'm not a woman, so I'm not going to say, say I disagree with you because that's true. And it's just, it's a lot of little things, honestly. And it's more than anything, it's it's avoiding a any kind of toxicity. And I mean, there's been, there are honestly things like, you know, trying to avoid having every kind of informal discussion happen in the bar. Because a lot of people don't like to drink. And it's things like that. Just making sure that everything you do is about getting people involved in a, in a, environment where they feel like they can't say those things. So I hope, does that kind of answer your question? So on the subject of pandering, hello, I am right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I want to talk about desirability within games. Mm -hmm. It's a personal pet, pet project of mine. I'm wondering about the diversity within romance options. Where are our fat romance options? Where are our dwarves? Pardon me, but why can't I romance a dwarf? And um, I'm Scott Harding. Oh my God, good job on Scott Harding. She's a blessing. Um, so my question is like, there's been a lot of well-earned fuss around not being able to romance dwarves and not having very diverse like romance options. And this really has a real impact on players because what we see as being desirable affects how we view ourselves. So is there going to be a project to have that? Is it going to be both in like character creator and in love interests? Like, so I can't I can't get into any specific details, obviously, for future projects. But what I can say is that's definitely something. They're both things we recognize. Um, in terms of the body types, that is something that we are pushing hard on. It's, and I mean, it's it's not it's kind of an excuse, but it's also kind of it's it is partially technical limitations because of the way that our animations and our rigging works. There's a lot of a lot more crashing when you get out of very specific body types. But we think we we're looking at we're actually working on a technical solution to that problem so that going forward we can have a much wider array of characters that have a much wider array of body types and just and then making those characters romanceful because like as you as you said that is definitely something that comes across when all the characters are 
the exact same body type. Everyone who's romanceful is the exact same body type. So, but I mean, the, yeah, because even on Inquisition, just going from going to essentially uh, eight different animation rigs, because both the male and female of each one required its own animation rig because of the way they were, they were built. That already that was something at, at the time, and again, not an excuse, but just a technical explanation. That was something at the time that all that already required about five months of work per person to just get all their scenes working with all the different races. But that being said, that's not an excuse, and that's something we are definitely looking at. And we are trying to push in future projects is to give more diversity of character, more diversity of body type to those characters. So, does that answer your question? And as, as to dwarves, yes, that is something that we're definitely working on. Hi, uh, great talk. Thank you for being here. Um, talking about the default, I can't help but notice as a disabled player that the default is often able-bodied. Um, and I know, especially in this work in particular, and you showed some pictures, there was some exploration, although very briefly, um, in having a disabled protagonist, although it doesn't really get explored. And I'm wondering if you think that's something that will ever really be explored in a mainstream game. Uh, where we'll see a, a disabled protagonist. I would personally, I would love to see that. I think, I think it's it's going to be a matter of figuring out what to do about some of the technical limitations, specifically because, again, there's specific animation sets and there are specific things that you have to do with the game. But there's no reason why we couldn't explore a disabled protagonist and having any variety. I think you're more likely to start seeing it show up more on characters who are the protagonist and then eventually the protagonist. But giving more, you know, followers characters who aren't who are, you know, major players in the game, having some kind of disability, having not being able-bodied. I think that's something that we would love to start exploring. I'm not I'm not knowledgeable enough about how locomotion and what, and all that stuff works to say how exactly we would solve all that and how we would solve the variability of disability. So, what do you, you know, what's the difference between a character who has one type of disability versus another? How do they animate differently? What does gameplay end up being? Does it change based on what disability that character has? Or is it I think it. I'm sorry, action. I just realized as I'm saying this, I'm exclusively thinking of games of character variants. I think it's something that games of preset protagonists should already start be should could already start exploring. Character creator makes it a little bit more complicated because then you have to accommodate essentially every possible type of disability that you give to people, and also able-bodied protagonists. But that's not saying it's something that can't be done, especially because you know machine learning. There's a lot of there's a lot of tools coming out that are making giving characters broader animation sets and broader move sets a lot easier than it used. So it's less a matter of everything has to be done by hand, has to be custom done, and more. Here's a here's 40 animation clips, shove them into a machine, and the machine figures out what animation clip to play next, and it can build move sets. So it's something that we should be exploring, though, because yes, as I said, that's all those things. Everything that's not that is not the default needs to be something we start looking at the ways in integrating. Into You had mentioned uh, earlier in your slides uh, that uh, one of the things you're doing to, to increase diversity is to have your team not look at all the same websites that you normally mm -hmm. would and to look at. But um, the, the white cis hat male is not just uh, default in games, it's default across all media. So uh, are you also looking at um, other media, how they handle diversity issues, and um, how do you address that and bring it back into the, the games? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, and it's definitely a, a thing that we, one of the other things we do is we have people watch diverse media or interact with diverse media. So not just playing the same game that everyone else is playing that are made by cis head white males or watching shows that are featuring cis head white males. I mean, Game of Thrones, I actually don't watch Game of Thrones because I, I don't like depressing shows and I find Game of Thrones, <laughs> much like Battlestar Galactica, gets to the point where I'm just watching, like, why am I watching? It just makes me sad. <laughs> but... I mean, things like that, getting people away from those shows and into things, into more diverse media created by by other, you know, people who aren't cis white male, so people who are, you know, queer identities, by people of color, by people who aren't able-bodied. It's just, and it's also figuring out a lot of what they've done, though, I would say, is just hiring more people of those diverse backgrounds. And that's something I think the biggest lesson we can take, which is, I, I, I'm not going to get too prop talk, but I, there was a, there was a, an interview recently with a fairly major comics publisher that um, I'm sure I'll be read it. And that, I'm, yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's, and that is the exact wrong thing to do, which is that is an example of what not to do. Don't, don't put something out. And I mean, we 
the games industry has been kind of bad at this before, but don't put something out with minimal marketing support and then say, eh, it didn't do well, so we're not doing another thing with those characters. It's like, well, yes, because you put it out and then just left it to die. So I think that that is one of the best lessons we can learn is support your diverse content. And if you don't, don't be surprised that it doesn't do well. And then don't then use that as an example to not build more diverse content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, just to give credit, I'm not the only person who has this question, I'm just the person who has the mic. Uh, and to prepare you, a few of us have been chatting on Twitter about the, the point of one of the best things you can do is to have more different hires on your team, which I don't think anybody is going to argue with. That is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. However, um, I want to know if, if, if you could address a little bit the idea that, that having that as your primary strategy also puts a lot of undue pressure on those hires. Especially to be the newsletter. Yep. Like, which, uh, I can project, it's fine. I can project. <laughs> They're good. <laughs> well, the main in the back. But I mean, yeah. the idea that, like, when I, when I meet as a cis gay dude, then I have lots of my straight friends who are like, what is this gay dude trying And I'm like, I don't, we don't have a newsletter. Yeah. That's not. So I, guess, I oh, maybe not. It, it, it's <laughs> really <laughs> fitting. Intermittent. Um, I guess just talk a little bit about how you balance getting diverse voices on your team, which is good, I agree, with making sure that the people who are closer to the default mm -hmm. on your team, who will always be there, like the default and the majority are connected. <laughs> like mathematically they're yeah. connected. That's how it works. So how can you how can you balance that? Oh, right. That's a really good question. I think there's a few there's a few points to it. One is, like you said, don't so I'm going to tell a little bit of a, a story. So we have one of the my closest coworkers is a cis gay dude, and he was invited to go to GamerX, and he actually approached me with a concern. He's like, "I just want to make sure that I'm not just being sent to GamerX because now I have become the token gay guy on the team." And I'm and I, and I said, "Yeah, that is an entirely fair concern." What I, what had hap actually happened is they had asked me if I wanted to go. I'm like, "And this is and it's good for you to bring it up." And I'm like, "I don't think I'm necessarily the best person to go because." Like you said, I am the default. I am the cis het white guy. You know, this other person would, would might want to go. And then the other thing we did is we also sent him to PAX East and PAX because it wasn't just about him being the token gay dude, but was in that specific situation, giving him that opportunity, but also acknowledging that he didn't want to end up being, like you said, the newsletter carrier. He tells us what all what all the gay guys are thinking. And <laughs> that's something that we have to avoid elsewhere, too, and it's bringing people onto the team but not putting that pressure on them to just be the voice of that. It's not just bringing someone on and saying, okay, now, you know what, we we have a, uh, we have a black, uh, you're, you're now the person who tells us all about black issues. It's no, you're the person who is really good at this technical skill set, And occasionally we're going to talk to you about that to make sure that, you know, you're, we're not doing anything that you hate, but you're not the default voice. You're not going to be the only person that talks about this. And it's also expanding your pool higher. So there's not just that one person egg and one person why it's making sure you have, a diverse group across the team. And like you said, we're still going to have, by default, the numbers, the default's still going to be a larger percentage of the team. And it's making sure that those people, I, I and I don't want to turn this into, you know, political viewpoint uh, persecution, but it's also making sure that you have people on your team that are willing to to be diverse, to accept the diversity, and are willing, wanting to seek out the diversity. It's finding people that are interested in going past what they're comfortable with, and it's interested in going past what is currently the default. So even your cis white gay men or white straight men need to be not just, so I'm at the point where I've been sick for like a week and it's just standing up here is very warm. I apologize if I, stumble, if I apologize if I stumble on my words a little bit, but it's making sure that those people are also interested in embracing the concept of having a diverse, diverse right against, and they have to want to do it. And it's making sure that those people are part of that group. So but yeah, like I said, you need to make sure it's not just, okay, now you, you're on the team, you're going to be our voice for this, and we'll find something else for you to do too. It's bringing them on for their skill sets and also and you know making sure that that if you have two people with comparable skill sets, one is diverse and one is just another cishet white guy, hire the diverse, consultant, the, the diverse person instead and just bring them on board and make sure that they are not, they understand that they're not just there to be that voice. So does that kind of answer the question? Yeah.
awesome <laughs> pro tips for my kids. I'm excited. Uh, thank you so much, John, for your talk, especially if you're ill. Super appreciate all your Q&A that you've been doing. I really appreciate particularly that you've been talking about getting diverse people in on the dev side. But one of the questions I have as a user researcher is, how do you ensure that you're play testing with the right populations, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you can, this might not be a fair question for you, but if you can comment at all on that. I'm well, I, can, I actually can comment because that's something, that is a question we've, so there was, I can't speak too much on what's, on things too far in the past. What I can say is that was actually a problem that we noticed is that all of our play, play testers, we don't actually do our play testing internal to studio. We have an outside group that we use. And every time we get the same feedback and it always very clearly came from a set of this had white guys because it was always like I don't care about this story. I mean, and this is this. I'm going to stereotype this that white guys. A lot of it was I don't care about this romance shit. And so it's like okay. And so we started looking for more more diverse, like basically giving the feedback to our UX or our user research group. We want people who are we want a more diverse group. Questions they ask, you know, when they start recruiting people, ask questions that are not going to just get you the same twenty people who play. The same games all the time. Well, the exact same, basically the exact same life experience. Get more people in there that are diverse, and you know, get them commenting on the art, get them commenting on the writing, get them commenting on the proposed gameplay as early as possible. Because yeah, that's user research. Whether or not I mean, and it's user research done well is a fantastic tool, and we love it. User research done poorly turns into a cudgel that they that is often used to say, well, no, 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 you got to make it more like this other game that's really popular right now. Because look, twenty people just told you that they really like and. I mean, I'm not. I'm picking out a game not because it's a bad game, but because it's. Twenty people just said they really like Zelda. You should make more like Zelda. Why aren't you using your game like Zelda? And it's like, well, okay, that's that's just pop, that's popular now. It's a good game, but it's not the game we're making. And that's even especially in our issues of diversity. It's like, yeah, they're all saying that they want more characters like this, but are they all saying that because that's a good thing, or are they all saying that because all twenty of them are pretty much copy pasted from the exact same template? So, no problem. Hi. Uh, most of my experience with Bioware games is actually Star Wars The Old Republic, okay. which is sort of a different beast than uh, Dragon Age or Mass Effect as a franchise. But um, something that I noticed is a lot of the companion characters, the ones that get introduced early, your, char your player character seems to develop a more natural relationship with them just by merit of spending, like, 40 levels with them. Um, and the fact that the all of the default companion characters are straight only. Uh, and then at level 60, you have the option of getting a DLC with those characters. I just wanted to know how your, how you, um, sorry, I didn't really format this question well, uh, how you feel about the timing of introducing companion characters, um, especially in sort of a format like that. It's actually interesting that you, that you asked that question, because I was looking back at it wasn't specifically the timing, but it was more specifically which characters are optional, which characters are default. And yeah, it's it's hugely important because I mean, even on Inquisition, we introduce you. Your first first character you, you meet is we well, meet Cassandra and Liliana. Cassandra is straight only, and then you introduce to Varric and Solus, and sadly you cannot romance Varric. And <laughs> Solus is again female elves only. So the first three characters you introduce. Two are straight, and one is, and I mean, so, and again, that's the, the thing. Nobody thought, nobody on the project was thinking, was doing that deliberately. And now that we look back on it, it's like, oh shit, that was that was a problem. We need to not do that. And so I think, yeah, it's important to bring in, to not just connect you to those characters first, because that's not only that doesn't only happen with romances. It also happens with which characters you take with you on your adventure. You're more likely the default party that you get, the first three characters you get. I don't remember what the numbers were, but it's something like 60% of players only ever run with that party. They don't bring anyone else in. So, I mean, in Inquisition, if you didn't get Iron Bull, or if you didn't get, um, I guess you could not get Josephine, but if you didn't, if you, and actually Dorian was the one I was thinking of specifically, because I was trying to remember, originally Dorian could not, you didn't have Dorian, Dorian was not necessarily recruitable. He actually died off screen if you didn't recruit him, and then we we like, oh shit, no, Dorian's awesome. <laughs> so uh, we, bring, we bring him, like if you chose the other path at the beginning. But I mean, that's the thing, is characters that are optional, especially if they come in late, you're less likely to develop a connection with. So something we would want to be doing in the future is the first characters you bring in are 
not necessarily always going to be, this sure shouldn't be in the straight characters. You should have a diverse group of characters with, as the first three characters you run into, for example, because Dragon Age games tend to have three followers, so at least the first three characters, you need to be focused on making that a, a diverse group, so you're more likely to develop a connection with one of those characters. So I can't, I can't speak to this, the Old Republic, unfortunately, because I'm not on that project team, but Dragon Age definitely isn't fanta hasn't been fantastic at that in the past, and it's something we definitely need to work on. So. Really quick, this is going to be our last so this, is, one. so this is kind of a different question than the others. I'm actually going to ask you about Sonic Chronicles. Um, <laughs> if, 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 Thank you. If a player takes a very specific sequence of actions, Sonic and Amy can actually end up becoming an official couple at the end of the game, which is very much against the grain of how Sonic feels most of the time. So um, did Sega provide any like particular limitations on what you could actually do with Sonic in terms of like what do you having like a romance not be too like explicit or like not being able to choose like rude or something? I have to be very careful about this question because uh, Sega also has very strong NDAs. Um, so I will say that Sega, as with all rights holders, and they're they're not the only one we've experienced this with. They do tend to be a lot more careful about what they let you do um, because they've got it's their IP and they they like to protect their IP. And I mean, I'll, I will always remember the stories I've heard about. Uh, Star Wars, not in turn out of the studio, but Star Wars IP outside the studio. Sonic was, they had a very specific thing, set of things that he can do, and I had a very, but their, their set of directions was Sonic has to always be going fast, and I can't remember the other two. <laughs> <laughs> and always, and I, I mean, and I, I like Sega, I, had, I played Sega games a lot as a kid, but I, I wish I could give you a better answer, and actually, if you look me up on Twitter, remind me to, to find, to poke around about that, because I actually do not remember specifically why that happened, and I kind of wish I did. So. I mean, I think you have to basically make, to the best of my knowledge, like five or six illogical dialogue choices. So I, unless you're really dedicated to it, I don't think most players will encounter it. No, and, and that's exactly it. And it might be one of those things that people just, that maybe so, maybe Sega just missed. But. <laughs> <laughs> and now they know we've done it. And now we're... <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Go fast. Thanks, everyone, for being a great audience. Thank you.